Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show, episode number 178, with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. How you doing? How you feeling? You Hope you guys are well, rested, hydrated, lubricated, limbered. Your mobility is where it should be. <coughs> You're clear-headed. You might have a coffee or two in hand, as I do right here. You might have a cup of tea, you might have a glass of water, you might be one of those flipping idiots that brings a massive flask with you and fills it up every 10 minutes uh, trying to, you know, some way circumvent all the shitty snacks that you eat on your desk. You might be one of those dudes that consistently gets up and checks their phone in the toilet because you're a pussy and you can't just do it on your desk. You might be one of those people that sits there at the desk and clock watches other employees coming in and then looks at your manager and makes fucking faces and goes, uh, 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 uh. you might be that person that's always talking about your weekend. You might be that person at the workplace that asks somebody about how their weekend was just so you can say what how amazing yours was. You might be the person that always has a story that can outdo the other person's story. If I go to Coachella, you've been to Burning Man. If I go to Burning Man, you went in a retreat to Bali. Everything is a one-upmanship. You might be that person that consistently orders stuff from ASOS, ASOS, however you pronounce that shit. Bags and bags are always coming in of shitty, crappy, made-in-China clothing that's going to last you all but two weeks. You might be the person that... All of a sudden now you're wearing white Air Force One and blue jeans because you think you're trendy and because you think you're a hipster. You might be that person who says, oh my God, K. is my favorite DJ. Die. All of you die, but I hope you have a good morning and you're feeling great. As you can tell, I'm wired and ready to go. I'm wired and ready to go. I think, you know, I think in general, <clears throat> when you have a really good weekend, or sorry, when you have a really good week, I'm really looking forward to the weekend. That's that's that. That's how bad. That's how that's how bad it's got, guys. All right. I was never the weekend dude, and now I'm being grinded down. Right. Employment has got me. You know, smashed me into smithereens. You know, like um, what are those things? Is it, are they called um, what are they called? Are they mortar pots? Ones that you grind um seeds up and stuff and into powder. Right. That's that's me basically. I've been ground, ground, ground down, and now I'm kind of you know letting it slip. That I might be looking forward to the weekend. Anyway, that aside, I think when you have a good week and you eat very healthy, and you work out, and you sleep adequately enough, I, I'm still not getting my seven to eight hours, I get about six now, I usually sleep at 12 o'clock or 11, and I wake up at six in the morning, so if I can get my sleeping, um, if I can sleep an hour earlier, like at 10 o'clock, I'll be fine, 10, maybe latest 9.30, then I'll have my full eight hours, at the moment, I'm not getting my four hours, so I'm not too sure how much benefits I'm actually gaining from my workouts, hopefully it's a lot, but that remains to be seen, if you listen to that dude that was on um, the Joe Rogan podcast recently, that sleep expert, um, I think he's got a book called out, Why We Sleep, he's mentioned something along the lines of, if you don't sleep enough, or you don't get the adequate amount of sleep in, all the workout you've done, all the dietary um, changes that you've made will be not for nothing. Like sleep is one of the, it's one of the, so it's what, that's what I mentioned the other day, right? It's, it's, it's this in the triangle um, that Tom Sachs mentioned, right? It's the fitness, it's the health and fitness triangle, like um, working out, exercise, diet, and um, sleep, of course. But I think there is something about working out and being healthy and all that sort of stuff where usually you have a bit of a lull, right? You feel a little bit shit for a bit, and then all of a sudden, your energy fucking picks up and you, you start bouncing off the walls. And that's how kind of I'm feeling now at the moment. I'm feeling very fresh, really vitalized and ready to go. Today, I did um, a workout where I ran around a block that I usually do 400 meters for six laps. Um, it was a pretty good workout. I think for the most part, I averaged out my average mile. I think it was about 730, which is quite good because the last couple of times I've done it, I think my, my first couple of miles were like eight minutes and then I went down to about seven. So, yeah. The first first one I did was oh wow it's awesome isn't it seven twenty as my average pace um the first one the first basic round I did which is usually my slowest because I'm I'm not really warmed up here I haven't got I haven't got going um and then from there it went from seven seven eleven per mile average pace then six fifty seven uh per uh, minutes per mile then six twelve then six fifty three then six oh three which was probably my quickest and then six thirty one. Imagine being able to keep a six thirty what a six oh three mile pace, man, consistently. That'd be so awesome. Um, I'd fucking love that. Probably got a lot more weight to lose in order to get that going. Um, for now, but you know, as it is, I'm happy with the progress that I'm making. Um, how the hell are you guys? I hope you guys are well. I'm good. I'm feeling nice. I'm feeling hydrated. Um, what are we talking about? Oh, number one, talking about. United losing to Barcelona at home. No surprise there, really, for the most part. Um, 
I think coming into the game and maybe even with the you know incredible um, comeback that we did against Paris Saint Germain, I think we kind of got brought back down to earth a little bit with the two defeats against Wolves in the FA Cup and in the league, um, and a little scruffy result. I forgot who we won against in between, but we had a little scruffy result in between. But I think we got pulled down back to earth a little bit, and I think it was good because what we saw with those performances against Wolves and stuff was that even though um, Tosha was coming and restored the kind of good feeling around the club, you still can't account for having really poor players in the most vital positions. I still think, um, and I think that's probably what we needed overall. I think Mourinho, what Mourinho did in general, which was probably the the worst thing he could have done was that he spoiled the morale. And then on top of that, the players that he wanted weren't there and he didn't necessarily rate the ones that he had, right? So he kind of just played them because he had no other choice. Um you kind of got that feeling. So he kind of didn't really give them confidence to go out there and perform. But what we're seeing with Ole Gunnar Solskjaer is that he's given the shit players in our team's confidence, but they just haven't got the ability to do what we want them to do, right? Um, you look at our centre-backs and, you know, apart from Lindelof, really, no one really comes out. And even Lindelof doesn't really do it that often. No one comes out with the ball enough into midfield and kind of uh, um, is an extra man in midfield to kind of thread the ball through to the midfielders, which would, never, which would never inevitably push everyone up the field a bit more. If you see us play, um, our centre-backs usually pass it along a straight line back and forth to each other. They hardly ever, ever push it forward or bring it forward up the pitch. If only, Maybe Lindelof does it. Smalling's not really his natural position, hence why Smalling doesn't play for England anymore because Gareth Southgate doesn't think he's good enough on the ball. Then you look at our, our left-backs, Luke Shaw is good, but we don't necessarily have a, a threat on the other side that can kind of really attack that line. Uh, Ashley Young just isn't good enough. His passing ability is really poor. That's the thing, Ashley Young, which just surprised me, really. I think we always assumed he wouldn't be a good defender because he's, you know, he's a, basically a converted um, winger in that respect. Um, but he's just not good at even delivering the ball. Even his crosses are garbage. I would have thought a converted right winger into a right back would maybe not be good going back, going backwards, right? Like defending against an out and out winger. But once given the opportunity to put a ball into the box would be amazing. In the same, in the same vein as um, a Kieran Trippier, right? He's not the best of defenders, but he's really good going forward, right? He, his delivery inside the box is amazing, right? Um, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a dead ball specialist as we saw with England. But we don't get that actually young. Even his short passing range, just to feet, is off. Like, he's crossing it off. Everything's just off. Then you look at midfield. We probably have a, a decent enough midfield, but we still probably don't lack the magic we need. Like, um, again, it's not it's a bit of a stretch to say we need a hazard, but someone in the team that can do the unpredictable can kind of, like, take it forward and kind of do a bit of magic. We don't necessarily have that. And up front, maybe, we don't really necessarily have an option. It would be good to have an option that... A, a Lukaku that wasn't a Lukaku. Somebody that could hold up... Because Lukaku is a weird player because he looks like a drug, but he doesn't play like a drug. But he's a, he's a kind of striker that plays with the last shoulder of a defender. He's more of a, he's more in the Michael Owen... Uh, Chikorito kind of vein of fame where he's looking for that ball in and around around the defender through the gaps over the top he's not necessarily looking to kind of bring it down like a Lewandowski um, hit into midfield and kind of run into the area he's not necessarily looking to do what um what Ronaldo did for his goal against Ajax right receives the ball in the middle of the park turns uh, uh, spreads it out wide runs into the area the ball comes in and he kind of heads it that's not really his play he's more like you know a quintessential kind of number nine striker. But it'd be good if we had that. So those are the deficiencies. I guess against Barcelona, we saw that too. But the interesting part about Barcelona was that, yes, people will say they didn't get out of second gear. You know, they were just strolling. But they didn't look as devastating as I thought they did. The Barcelona we faced, I think, in 2011 were a far better team than what we have here, of course, because that was probably their pump. But it didn't look that great, right? I think if you're Man City or Liverpool, um, Man City, Liverpool, or Tottenham, I think you're going to fancy your chances playing against Barcelona. They're not the they're not the side that we once knew. Obviously, they've got the X factor of Messi. They've got Suarez who can always damage um, um what you got punish you. Rakitic is somebody you can never really uh, take for granted. But by and large, they don't necessarily have the weapons that you'd think they would do. Maybe um, uh, Dembele off the bench. Vidal was pretty useless when he came on. Um, I like to look at Arthur. But by and large, it wasn't that great Barcelona. And I think if if we were better. If we had a, if we had a shooting boots on, if we were a bit more clinical, if Rashford wasn't coming back from an injury, if Martial didn't come off the bench cold, if maybe Pogba was able to take the game by scrap his neck, which he still ain't capable to do, we might have been able to scab sc a result in that game. But I just think we we didn't we lacked that bit of magic in the final third to really punish them or to really kind of go for Barcelona's jugular. But what I like again, what I said before, with the regards to um appointment, I see some fans on social bemoaning his tactics, and now you got it wrong. I don't really give a shit about that sort of stuff. He tried to do something, it didn't work out. I think for the most part, tactics maybe impact 
I don't know, the first 30 minutes of the game, for me, in my opinion. And then after that, most players, especially the top ones, are, are adept or are willing to kind of go to the manager, go to the coaches and tell them, look, this ain't working, let's change it or change themselves on the pitch, right? Not necessarily a thing that, I don't think tactics are always the, the reason why teams lose. They can play a part in it, but if you're a top team, players should be able to adapt to what's going on in the field. But what I like about Olegan Solskjaer and what I think he's done really well is that he's given players ultimatums. He's also given them a platform to kind of show why they should still be at the club and why they should maybe, um, you know, who should earn a deal and who shouldn't earn a deal. And I think the opportunity he's given to Scott McTominay, Scott McTominay, sorry, the opportunity he's given to Fred, the opportunity he's given to Dallo playing in the kind of, you know, advanced wing-back role, um, I think is something that should be really um, spoken about a bit more highly. Like, Scott McTominay was fucking awesome. Even though we lost, he probably on my man the match. He was amazingly good, man. I thought he was quite limited technically, but he's improved. He really... I think a lot of these kind of players... I flex, Fletcher was the same. A lot of those kind of bang average players, they usually perform a lot better when they're surrounded by better players. They step up a bit more because they don't want to disappoint their teammates, right? They have a, they have a, a real big sense of pride, right? They don't want to let anyone down. So the better players you surround them with, the better they perform. Fletcher was the same as that, right? Whenever he started into midfield, playing alongside Ronaldo, Tevez, Runo, he's kind of, he played really well. But the moment it was like a he was playing within a second team and he was what he was um, asked to be the leader and he had a captain's armband on, that's when you get to see how he's kind of level. But the, he was always he always performed freakishly well against the better teams. Same like Jisham, Jisham Park, for instance, right? And so Alex Ferguson like, loved to play him against the top teams because he always brought the best out of him. And Scott McTominay was awesome. Like, he covered every blade of grass. He kind of followed Messi around all over the pitch. When he got on the ball, he was really good. He held on to it. He won fouls. He tackled well. He was aggressive on the ball. Just in general, a really good player. And he kind of gave the op the license for Pogba to kind of, you know, get a bit more forward up the pitch. And again, Pogba wasn't as good as he should have been. First half, he played really well. Second half, he kind of died down. I think he kind of got a bit discouraged with Barcelona keeping the ball too often. Um... And of course, Fred. Fred was great, man. And um, being the screen behind the defense, like spreading it out wide, like amazingly good. If anything, is a bit frustrating, Fred, because he doesn't really bring the ball forward as much as I hope he would. Um, some he was doing a couple of incisive passes, um, through the lines, uh, kind of you know the low, he did like a really good no look pass the second half that kind of Rashford kind of um, didn't be, latch onto properly. But in general, Fred played really well. So so well that I think he kind of, again, earned his opportunity to kind of get given a second chance this next season, right? A full preseason with a new manager, hopefully with a, a couple of new additions, we'll probably see the best out of him. Um, and again, the second leg is probably a misnomer. I'm not really expecting much of it. I don't really think we're going to go to the new camp and turn them over. But again, this is football. You never know what may happen. But what again, like I think what I think um, has happened with um, the Ole Gunnar Solskjaer appointment is that we just got a bit more confidence in us, right? We just feel as if like we can go to these clubs, we can go to these stadiums and we can um, we can give a good account of ourselves, right? And I think in general, um, having a taste of this football, um, of the Champions League, sorry, having a taste of rubbing shoulders against the elite, having a taste of just how short we're coming up against these teams and our lack of quality, because players know, right? You play with a team, enough, you know how shit you are. You know if you're kind of, you know, if you're punch away above your weight. I think the players are well aware of that. But I think next season, or I think no, this season, whilst we're playing, the players are going to be determined to make sure that we get back into Champions League next season so that the new additions that come into it will give them a better opportunity to kind of rewrite the wrongs of this season going going forward. But again, maybe Solskjaer got his tactics wrong. Maybe he was a bit um, conservative in the first half, but you can't blame him considering the weapons that uh, Barcelona had. If we went toe-to-toe -to -toe with them, we would have probably got spanked 3-0. Let's not kid ourselves about that. Um, but I think, oh, all in all, I think we fought back pretty well after the early goal. The early goal was sloppy as fuck, but you know, we got those. We we are playing Smalling and Lindelof from centre back. Like I don't think we can really get too um um what you call it missed by that. If we're gonna get you know if we're gonna get done over by you know clever balls over the top and Messi kind of spring in no look crossover. Yeah, I mean I can't think we can get too annoyed by it. But I think overall it was a great um performance by us. A disappointing result. Hope we it probably would have been advantageous to get a goal, get a draw. It might have been an accurate representation of the game overall i don't think barcelona were that good we might have got the better opportunities in general but by and large i don't think barcelona came out of second gear we didn't really take opportunity of that and let's see what happens the second leg going forward um moving on up moving on in this leads us nicely to this kind of news which was kind of interesting so um are you familiar with mma do you watch? Do are you a fan of mixed mental, mix mix martial arts? I always say mixed mental arts, um, but mixed martial arts. Do you like UFC? Well, if so, you would have known that TJ Dillashaw 
has unfortunately been banned for two years because he tested hot. He popped hot. He pissed hot for an EPO. An EP fucking O. If you wonder what an EPO is, that's what most of the Tour de France guys use. Um, made famous by the likes of Lance Armstrong and many others before him. Because what EPO does is it allows you essentially to go for longer. It's like an endurance um sports uh you know ped right performance enhancing drug right it allows you to it, it just allows you to have cardio for days and i guess you know at the weight that tj dillashaw fights having a, a, a gas tank of that kind of ilk is just you know you can't really um what's that called you can't really equate how much of um how much how much that really helps you in your performance so disappointing going forward um the thing that makes it really gnarly is that they went back to his previous fights um, and they and they realized that he tested hot for the previous two fights that he'd done. They fought when he, I think when he when he, when he um knocked out Cody Garbrandt, so they gave him a two year suspension. And again, um, considering his age, considering the stigma around PEDs, that's essentially his career over. But what makes it what's really funny to me is a conversation around it because I listened to a little bit to the fire and a kid with Brendan Shaw and um Brian Callen. And Brendan Shaw was going on and on and on about like how it's a, a, like this is this is a dangerous precedent that they're setting. Um, USADA by testing people um, from their previous fights. They said, oh, how far back are they going to go? If they're going to test two years ago, are they going to dig up like old legends and test their thing? And what happens? with are trying bands and the fighters don't have any say, could have a union. Just kind of bemoaning the fact. And it really didn't really make sense to me in general, right? Because I think his general um, understanding of it, him being a professional fighter, Brendan Shaw, which, you know, he's got much more knowledge of it than I have. But his general kind of impression of it was that everyone kind of does drugs, right? Everyone does some sort of performance enhancing drug because at the elite level of sports, the f- margins are so thin that if any, if anyone could get any kind of advantage, they're going to take it, right? I think that's what he could basically is getting at. And that's fine. That's when the problem was okay. But I think to the average consumer, to the general public, I think we have this impression in our heads that our favorite athletes are not on drugs. We have the impression that they're drinking Lucozade, um, they're drinking water, they're eating an orange, they're doing yoga, they're working out, lifting weights, and that's how they're the best player. And then matched with their talent, that's how they become what they become in a sport. There are some of us that are a bit more savvy, they're a bit more in the know, that have this understanding that there are some people in the sport that are using some performance hunting drugs. But I think it's a little bit of a stretch to say that everyone is doing it because I don't think everyone is doing it. That's the thing. Right? I don't think everyone is doing it. I don't think everyone can do it, especially stuff like EPO. These are like the, um, these are like the, um, this is like the luxury fashion um, version of it, right? Like the other stuff is like, I don't know, high street um, drugs. But this is like the luxury fashion. Um, this is stuff where you need a doctor, you need a consultant, you need a plan, you need it to get specked out in the calendar. This is some high level shit. You can't just take this. You can't just buy this stuff at a gas station, for instance, right? So with this sort of stuff, not everyone can do it. So the idea that everyone is doing it, that's why that's why they shouldn't go back and retroactively ban people from the other previous fight. It's a bit of a weightless argument. It's not doesn't really have any substance to me in that regard. And I also think it's not a bad thing for Usada to come in and try and clean up a sport that, you know, the UFC and Dana White is obviously trying to make mainstream, right? They're trying to push this thing into the mainstream. They're trying to give it an image that it's clean or whatever it may be. It happened in baseball, right? When they did, um, when they popped everyone, and um, that kind of, you know, led to a bit of a low. And then after that, I'm not sure the testing is as stringent as it was previously. But you need to give the public the impression that you're trying to do something. You can't just let everyone just go, you know, just do whatever they want to do and it be the wild, wild west. Even though we know as a public that for sure some people are doing it. We want the impression that they're on top of it and no one is doing it. And I think for the fighters that aren't doing it, it's a little bit unfair as well to have this idea that, you know, we're just going to have a hands-up attitude. And if you, you, you know, you're allowed to do stuff as long as you're not silly with it. No, I don't think that's really fair in that regard. And I think in general, like most fighters, or especially um, pundits out there who look at these sort of issues, they always kind of complain that, you know, the sport isn't um, fair in some regards, right? Whether it comes to pay or whether it comes to fights or whether it comes to sponsorships or promotions or whatever it may be. And the one thing that, the you know, the UFC is trying to clean up is the side, you know, the performance side of it, right? To try to make sure that everyone's on an even playing ground. And somehow people are complaining about it. And it's a bad thing. I don't think that is a bad thing because, you know, you're talking about mixed men- you're talking about mixed martial arts, right? You're talking about the high level um, combat, right? You're talking about people who are trained killers for the most part, right? You're talking about people who do doing this, right? Who've been, you know, practicing a, a certain type of martial arts for, you know, X amount of years under the tutelage of some of the best pra- uh, best um, practitioners in the world or teachers in the world. Then you add on top of that the fact that they have performance enhancing drugs. 
it's extremely dangerous for the person that doesn't do it, right? If you get will kicked in the head by somebody and then suddenly they jump on top of you because referee hasn't um, got across to um, end the fight and you end up getting seven, I don't know, three or four elbows off the top of your head because they got energy for days, you could, you could, your life could be um, dramatically changed forever, right? You could never be, the, you probably won't be the same person ever again. So the fact that, you know, um, we should have a hands-off attitude towards it, I don't think that is... Um, wise i don't think that's also taken into consideration the safety of other fighters and also like i said it's just not fair for people that can't do it and won't do it because there's plenty of fighters out there that aren't doing this sort of thing and i think by and large these um um bans should act as a deterrent for most people that you know most people know that if they do do it they have to do it with the most high level person in the world they have to commit to spending a lot of money and if they do get um, cool, then they're going to get banned, right? And I think we saw with TJ Dillashaw when the news came out that he got, he got popped. He immediately vacated his belts. Well, but, and I think from there, we could have automatically saw that, okay, cool, this is something bad because he, he immediately understood what the severity of it was. He kind of knew the field he was playing in, right? He knew that if he got popped, it was going to be over for him. But I just find it strange that some people in the MMA world are kind of a bit up in arms about this. Like, people are, like, I don't know. Like, it's, for me, it's like VAR. Like, this is this is cheating, right? Let's not put any other word against it. Whether or not everyone is doing it or not, whether or not this is what happens in professional sports, this is cheating, right? You shouldn't be taking drugs to make your performances better. This is what it is, right? You that's not within the laws rules of the game. So it's cheating by and large. So if it's cheating, you should try and get cheating out of the sport. You're not gonna get it all the way out. It's impossible to do that. Because I'm sure the um, technological advances in PEDs are always one step ahead of the testing. It's essentially, the testing is trying to catch things that they have no idea they're trying to catch, right? Um, and they only have to ca they have to catch one person in order to have like some form of frame of reference or what's going on. And it gets sophisticated, sophisticated. I'm sure the money in it for the doctors that are making these drugs is is crazy because you know the gains that the athlete can have are you know there's no amount of money you can put on. Um, if you take a performance enhancing drug, there's no amount of price. There's no amount of price you wouldn't be willing to pay to get away with it because you know what that could do for your career, right? We saw even recently Woodley come out saying, "Oh, um, he never knew how much the belt um, could. He never knew how much um, credence um, he was given because he was a champ. Uh, then now that he's lost it, right, against um, um, Kamara Usman, right, he's realized that how much of that, what, how much that belt added to his kind of overall legend. He says, of course, that like, I'm still a big deal, but he's he's can see the difference of what life is like without the belt. So imagine all the opportunities um, Woodley had uh, got because he was a champion, right? Um, things that he probably isn't aware of that came um, just hand in hand because he was walking around with a belt and he was a champion of the UFC. Now imagine if you are a, a guy that's, I don't know, top 10 ranked and you're trying to climb your way up. There's no price you can put on the idea that if you smoke a couple of people um, that you got lined up and then you get a title shot in your third fight, that could that could drastically change your life and the life of your family, right? Or the life of your family's family if you play it correctly. Um, but again, I, I, I just think it's a weird thing to argue against. I think it's cheating by and large. And I, I look at it in the same way as VAR. People, like some football pundits out there like, oh my God, this is ruining the game, the stoppage and all that stuff and waiting for the decision. Dudes, we watch football and we support the teams we support. When a, when a decision happens that's clearly wrong and teams advance, we get annoyed. What happened recently with uh, Terry Henry thing where he, he handballed the ball, right? And um, Ireland got knocked out of the thing and France went through. I forgot, was it the Euros or something like that? That was a handball. We all knew it was a handball. France cheated. They got through because VAR wasn't around. We don't want that to happen, right? That's not what football's about. We don't want somebody to earn a penalty kick because they dived, right? And no one touched them. And then that goal they score is a 1-0 just before half time. And that changes the whole com complexion of the game. The other team was on top. They they had a counter attack. The person dives in the box. They score one one goal before half time. That completely changes the climate of the game. We don't want people getting sent off because somebody did like a phantom headbutt that didn't really happen. These things we don't want. So we get VAR to change the decisions to help referees out because no referee job is hard and pilots complain. Look at just the other day with um Barcelona's uh, first goal, the Suarez goal. The linesman immediately flagged it off like it was offside. You can understand why, because he looking from the naked eye looked offside. Immediately checked it on VAR. It got proven it was a goal. Done. No problem. We're not we're not criticizing the, the linesman because he's doing it in real time, and we're not criticizing VAR because they got to the right decision. But I just don't get this understanding that all this help that they're trying to impart in sports to try and clean it up, try and make it a better sport for people to watch. Somehow people are getting annoyed by it. It's just a very very bizarre thing to look at. But anyway, this is an article on um, MMA fighting that talks about it. 
TJ Dillasaur seemed for greatness, um, headed for greatness. Turns out he was too good to be true. Um, this kind of stuff, I don't really, you know, again, if you're Cody Garbrandt, I get it, right? It's, an, you know, the guy that beat you twice was on was on stuff. But I think in terms of skill, I don't think, I don't think we can look at those fights and say TJ, TJ Dillasaur won because of his endurance. He won. Hmm, it's hard to judge though, isn't it? Because he's, in, you know, his skill, your endurance is better. If you, your, your, I'd imagine you could use your skills better if you've got better endurance. Anyway, but I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Could you? But I, I still see how Cody could be upset. You got knocked out by this guy twice, and you was popped twice. Like you know. But anyway, it goes on. Uh, the article says as following: It took barely, uh, it took barely over three weeks from the time TJ Dillashaw revealed he failed a drug, uh, a a post fight test of, of his acceptance of penalty, a two year ban from the competition. In the end, there was really nothing to contest. Even after initially told his fans in an Instagram post that I'm working with my team to understand what has occurred. The thing is, the evidence shows that T.J. Dillashaw knew all along that he had occurred. He was blatantly cheating. Not only did Dillashaw test positive for uh, recumbent human erythritol EPO in a urine sample he provided in January 18, 2019. He started went back and rested, tested, retested the 28, uh, December 28 sample. That too came back positive. With that, it was checkmate. EPO stimulates the production of red blood cells, which improves oxygen delivery from the lungs to the working muscles, which allows you to work your body past normal points of stamina. Having read this, right, it's, I don't know, would this be strange to say? How many people do you think take EPO that just run regular park runs and London marathons and Hockney Half Marathons? How many people do you think that do that? Do you think there's some psychos out there, like some, you know, high-performing, maybe not even high-performing, just some, you know, running enthusiasts like myself who really wants to do well and decides that they're going to take an EPO, um, when they're going to run the Berlin Half Marathon. I think there's quite a few of them, isn't it? It must be a lot of people that do it. it there must be. There must be. And again, I think I, me I mentioned um, before that, I think Brendan Shaw mentioned it, that, uh, that EPO isn't a drug that you can take, like, you know, just off the shelf. It's not like some, It's not like sticking a lean up, up your ass. You need to be monitored and have a doctor on standby and all that sort of stuff because it thickens your blood and shit. But I'm sure nowadays, especially when you look at someone like Tim Ferriss, is always that kind of um, uh, self-experimenting. I'm pretty sure you could do it uh, to yourself if you wanted to, right? I'm pretty sure you could. Probably not the safest thing to do, but must be some psychos out there that are administering EPO um, to themselves. Um, crazy, isn't it? Like, imagine if you're like a, just a regular dude and you're taking an EPO so you could you can beat your PR at the fucking Hackney Half Marathon or the London Marathon. That must be nuts. Anyway, it's a huge competitive advantage, one that could, say, allow you to keep blasting powerful combinations as your opponent begins to work from exhaustion. But Dillard showed that was a speciality. He was a world volume fighter who could crack all night. Turns out he was assisted for at least one night, maybe more. Um, the EPO that Dillard tested positive for is uh, synthetic. It's injectable only. There's no chance it was mistakenly included in some sort of in some store bought supplement or gas station pill. It was taken on purpose. It was taken to cheat. Um, some fight. Oh, I wonder who else is gonna get popped, man, from this. Think about. It. I wonder who else they're gonna pop for this. Because you know, you know, it's, it's not only again. I don't believe everyone takes drugs, but you know, it's not only Tito Deluso for sure. Some fighters have tested positive but walk through the sport un under a haze of confusion regarding their guilt. John Jones, right? Which cannot be totally exclusively determined. Dillard Shaw will not be one of those. He is now and forever will be tainted. It is a long fall from grace for a fighter who had unexpectedly surged. But UFC probably won't allow John Jones to get tested hot because he's their guy. If he goes, it's finished. He's essentially holding up the UFC single-handedly, isn't it? Look how, much, look how many times he's going to fight this year alone. Like, fucking hell. Um... Who was expectedly, um, it was a long fall from Grace from a fighter who unexpectedly, unexpectedly surged from modest success as a collegiate fighter at Cal State to consideration as one of the best pound for pound fighters on earth. Heading into January's UFC event, Dillashaw seemed poised to add a second UFC division of competition already in resume. All he had to do was defeat smaller Harry Nusuto to capture the flyweight. He lost in styling his fashion, and whatever aura remained is now washed away completely with the uh, latest revelations. In one fell swoop, he went from potential double champion to knockout victim. Him, drug tester flunker, uh, belt relinquisher, and suspending fighter. They're going ham on him, isn't it? Jesus Christ, MMA fighting. He got hit with three pieces, with three pieces on the USADA. Jesus Christ. It was a devastating period that will define his legacy as much as the two title reigns. Dillashaw had been accused of using PDs before, including by former Team Alpha male teammate Cody Garbrand and Krim um, Holdsworth. Chris Holdsworth, sorry. Such accusations are not unusual, particularly from rivals. 
but these are arrived with more bite given the past they ship in play. In one instance, Garbrandt specifically accused Dillashaw of taking AP EPO T time after time, Dillashaw shrugged off the basis accusations. Dillashaw has yet to publicly comment since accepting his two-year ban, but there's nothing much he can say to dig himself out of this one. His reputation and damage is sealed, still to be determined, um, though is his athletic future. With his punishment is up, he'll just have three weeks shy of his 35th birthday, an age which few fighters wait, f few light, which few lightweight fighters continue to excel. For comparison, the average age of a bantamweight division fighter is 29, so this may well be more than just a temporary band it may be the end of Dillashaw as a divisional force I doubt that though he probably won't come back to the UFC probably end up going to 1FC or you know fighting and rise on something like that that'll probably be somewhere he can go earn some money and take as much EP over as he wants those guys over there don't give a shit um, but yeah hard hard news to take for the two Dillashaw fans out there um, I still think it's cheating I don't get all the hoopla from people like Brendan Schaub um, getting scared that people other people are going to be you know retroactive bands are going to happen for everyone I think you sound like an easy come out and say, you know, every fighter we test um, that's fighting now in the current pool, we can look back two years. I think that's fine. I think that's a good window, right, to look back at fights so everything else can kind of be null and void. Um, I think if you take, if you've been taking stuff two years ago, you're going to be taking it now. I don't think you're just going to take it for one fight two years ago and then suddenly stop taking it now. I don't think it's something that you you suddenly stop taking, especially if it's giving you that good results. Um, so I'm not really that um, bothered about it in that regard. But yeah, sad news for TA Dillashaw fans. Um, Again, I, I don't think it takes away from his victories against Kobe Garbrandt. I still think he probably would have still beat him. But you know, for in the sake of for for sake of for the sake of clarity, cheating is cheating and you have to get banned in that regard, isn't it? Um moving on in, moving on up. Ba, 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 ba. Oh, cult devotion. So I'm thinking of getting a bike. I'm thinking of getting a bike, right? That's what I want to do. I want to get a bicycle. Now, my bicycle history has been a bit um sketchy um to say the least right um every bike i've got so far in my life right from when i was young from, no, from when i was young yeah from when i was young until this age until this particular age i'm at now which is 21 thank you for asking has been a hand me down has been a borrow me down has been something i've jacked or something i bought off gumtree facebook or whatever it may be called right i've never bought a new bike in my life no i lie i have bought i bought one sorry shit i did buy one i bought a charge stove i just remember now I bought a charge stove, right? Which is this one. Let me get it up on the screen so you guys can see. I bought this bike here, right? This is the bike that I bought. The only bike I bought in my life um, uh, that was mine, right? I bought a charge stove. It's this one here. And it was brand new. I think I bought this one on like Evan Cycle or something like that. One of those websites back in the day when I used to work at Nike. And essentially, it's a 20... Is it 24-inch... Um, 20, is it 24 20 oh it's 26 okay it's 26 inch um bmx kind of you know a big bmx bike sort of thing and i had this bike i used it all the time it's something i used to ride on the way to work um i actually changed i actually changed this this is the kind of way i changed it, actually i didn't have the um the neon green pedals but i did have the neon green grips i loved the bike it was my favorite if anything the only thing wrong with it was that the frame was super heavy and the components were a bit shit um i should have changed them quite earlier on when i was riding it but i didn't really get a chance trying to do it and then by the time i started and then and then when i moved to this flat here I did start riding it a lot more often, but it got a bit harder to ride because I lived so far away in Stratford and everything else I was doing was in East, so it kind of got a bit hard to ride, um, especially because, you know, it's got such a small um, gear link or chain, whatever it may be called. It's, what's it called? Um, chain link, whatever it's called. Uh, the gear ratio is really small. I don't know how, to, how you describe it. So it kind of got tiring to ride it day in, day out, but I really enjoyed riding it. I lost loads of weight doing it. Like, it's a good, jumpy, fun bike to ride around. They call it the pub, the pub runner, whatever it may be called. So that's the last bike I had. And um, ever since then, everything else has been a hand-me-down. And um, I've been unlucky as well because every, everywhere I've been working so far has been quite far, right? So the last place I had a, I had a bike was in Shepherd's Bush. I used to work around that area. And I had a hand-me-down bike that I bought off, I don't know, Facebook or some shit for like 50 quid. And of course, those kind of bikes aren't really made for you to be riding, you know, five plus miles back and forth, right? And I used to, I used to no joke, right? I used to no joke... Um, ride from here to shepherd's bushes i think it's about six miles i think it's six miles right let me see if it's six miles i think it might be six miles let me see if i can get it up on here white is this show the white city white city let's do white city white city hmm. white city station 10 oh, 10 miles <laughs> i don't know how i did that 
<laughs> oh my god oh my god i don't know how the fuck i did that that is insane brother okay cool so i used to i used to i used to cycle right like that's a that scene out there i used to cycle 10 miles back and forth to work right um on my bicycle so essentially i was i was going i was doing just under a marathon a day right and that's probably why i was fucking the skinniest i've ever been in my life so i think i might have been 100 and 87 190 pounds now i'm about 220 ish year pounds so imagine how thin i must have looked back then um so i was doing that every day and of course the bike i had just couldn't handle that kind of mileage and eventually broke down so much so a couple of times i had the unfortunate mess of going to work without my oyster card my bike breaking down and me having to get a train back home and begging the person at the gate to let me through so essentially just a bit of a shit show so i've been able to not i've been without a bike and then this charge drive i did have it kind of broke. I think I was going to fix it. And then um, I left it downstairs where all my bikes are locked up in my flat. And then um, they had this massive clean out of all the bikes that were there. And my bike was kind of taken away and thrown in the bin because I didn't claim it. Anyway, long story short, I need to get a new bike. And I want to get another sort of charged over. I want to get another 26-inch BMX. Like, I really enjoyed it. It was fun to ride. They're small, don't get me wrong. I look kind of big and ridiculous on them. But I like the idea of having that kind of bike and riding it around, right? So the bike that I want to get at the moment, uh, th there's two that are on my list. The one bike is this one. It's called the Cult Devotion. So Cult um, Devotion uh, 26, not 29. There's two. There's 29 inches or 26 inches. I want to get the 29 inch, the 26 inch. I like that kind of smaller shape. So you've got this bike here. It's called the Cult Devotion. I think you guys can see it here on screen. I'm going to put it up there, the big one. So essentially, it's the same like the charge stove. Um, the seat, the bike seat, I like the part of the bike seat kind of bends back slightly a little bit. So it's not going to be as uh, forward facing as before. Sometimes my knees will be rubbing up against the, the handlebars. So essentially, it's a big BMX, as you can see there. The reason why I want to buy it, if you're wondering, is because I saw this um, image actually of Lee Spellman. Is it Lee Spellman? Um, Lee Spellman, Twitter. Uh, the guy from, what's his name? What's the band he's from? Babylon? Is it Babylon? What, what's, the, what's the band he's from? Trash Talk? Is it Trash Talk? Is it Trash Talk? I think it's Trash Talk. Anyway, Lee Spellman tweeted this the other day because um, he's, he's got he's got the FTP version of the bike, right? He recently picked up. I'm not sure if he got given it as a gift or something, but I think he posted it somewhere. Where is it? Oh, did he take it off? Maybe he took it down. He had an image of the bike that he posted just now. Or maybe I'm bugging out. Oh, man. I think he might have taken it down. But Lee Spellman had, had an image of his um, FTP one, right? So let me see if I can find the FTP Colt uh, bike. It looks fucking awesome. Hopefully someone has it here. Let's see. Has he got it there? FTP Colt. Yeah, so that, that that's basically the bike that everyone has here, but you can't exactly see it. But this is basically where I where I saw it and I could, thought I won it. So this is the FTP version, right? Right, FTP, legendary LA streetwear brand. Um, they've done a collaboration with Colt, who seem to be like the number one kind of um, kind of bike brand or BMX bike brand that everyone sort of wants. I've seen loads of reviews on them on, on, on the YouTubes and stuff. And look how nice that looks, right? So it's a black frame with uh, metallic silver forks, metallic silver um, handlebars. It just looks amazing, right? It looks really fucking nice, right? Um, $600 um is it available now or then let's go what's one three can you just oh, okay visit the link finish the website where you can you can add links to stuff that you want to get right i'm assuming is it on their website now to check yeah six hundred dollars so this is the kind this this is why I, this is what i saw and i kind of thought you know what i think i need this bike i think i need one of these bikes again back in my life so it's ftp uh 20 26 inch uh bmx right in collaboration with colt um it says yes yeah, integrate headset colt nylon pedals uh nylon pedals doesn't they look, they look nylon to you hmm. oh, nylon to me um look how nice that looks though silver again so the, the, uh this is one option right that's option number one let me try if i can get away from this option number one's that and then it says so to, um integrated headset cold nylon pedals heat treated cranks whatever that means sealed mid bottom bracket cold 410 420 chain and I think the good thing with Colt is that it, you know, it's um, it's gonna be a good. The components are pretty good. I'm receiving right here. So that's one uh, one I wanted to get. So that's six hundred dollars. So about five hundred quid. Then the next one I thought I really wanted to get was this one's a bit cheaper and it looks really nice though. To be honest, it's called a, it's called a Kink Drifter. 
So it's between this and the uh, and the uh, and the other one that I mentioned previously. So let's let me just get this up for you, and you guys can see, and we can go through this. So let me pause this. Da, da, da. It's a little video, the review, and again, and there's quite and again maybe because I'm ignorant of the kind of BMX community, but having looked online, there's quite a few um, BMX influencer videographer people on YouTube doing some cool videos, man. I've seen quite a few of them. Like some of them take inspiration from see what Casey Neistat has done in the past, but loads of really cool uh, BMX dudes doing some great things on the old BMX front. Um, so this is another bike that I went to get. Um, it's called the Kink Drifter 26 inch 2019 edition. I think it's like $400 or something along those kind of lines. Um, there's a little video here kind of describing exactly, showing exactly why I kind of want it. And I'll play it for you guys now. Let me get it up here. I go right. da, 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 da. Cool, let's do this. And this, and this is why I kind of want it, right? It's just kind of a, every, it's a good everyday sort of bike. It's a bit hard to ride, loads of miles and stuff, but better, good enough for like the everyday streets and doing your thing. The guy looks like about similar height to me. That's probably gonna be what I look like when I ride it and shit. You can do kind of standard tricks, you know? Park it up against a pub, you're gonna, I'm looking to park it up against a pole and that, I'm gonna just saw that in half. But yeah, you know? I think it looks sexy as fuck, innit? And it's all black too, it comes already quite well done. I won't need to do anything to it. Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of it, man. I think I, I think I want to do it. One brake, brake at the back. Great new tires. And I was thinking as well, because I saw some someone the other day actually um, had a bit of an accident on there. Again, I wonder what that slit is on the back of that thing. What do you think that little hole is on, on, on the on the back seat? Is that look? Is that something to put something in? Is that like a little screw to make it taller? I wonder what that is. A little slit there. But I saw, I saw someone recently um, having to change their tire when their bike had a puncher on the street the other day, and I was thinking, fuck, that's why I don't miss, isn't it? When you're riding your bike and you get a punch on the way to work. But I think what I might do because I just got no time for all that shit. I'm just gonna pack a couple of inner tubes in my back in my fucking um, satchel when I'm riding around, right? Because every time you have a bag, I'll just I'll just essentially buy four inner tubes. And just have two of them in my backpack and two of them in my side satchel or whatever kind of waist bag that I'm wearing at the time. Like, imagine if I've got um, one of these uh, bad boys on. Uh, imagine if I'm wearing one of my one 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 of my side bags, like this little Supreme one I've got here, or this little Places and Faces one that's fucking smashed to smithereens. But I'll probably have one of those. And just chuck them, chuck my um, inner tube in there because I just got no time to be sitting there and fe making sure I know where the hole is and and kind of gluing it up again. That's just long, no 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 time for that whatsoever. But yeah, I think I'm gonna get that in a couple of months. I need a bike, man. Um, especially you know I was thinking, especially for my DJing stuff, like just to kind of because I don't really play too far from where I live. It's always in Leighton Stone, Stratford, that sort of area, or sometimes in Hackney, Cent in Hackney, uh, playing in those warehouses, or even in Dawson and stuff. And it's just nice to kind of be able to kind of you know go down a bike and nip back home quickly as well because you know like and as well there's not i know it's bad to say but there is not quite there's nothing quite like dry, riding back home after night out a bit tipsy man it's so cool you sober up so quickly like driving riding back on a bike like because your senses get heightened your the wind's blowing in your face your your you're just your adrenaline's pumping i loved it back in the day and again i think in general whenever i used to have a bike and i was going out um hanging out with my friends in east whatever it may be and i was commuting back and forth i was a bit mindful about how much i was drinking or how fucked i was gonna get it kind of did temper me down a little bit so i think that is gonna be overall a good benefit to me going forward but yeah those are the two bikes i'm kind of looking at if anyone out there has any other suggestions or bikes they think i should be getting or something i should be looking at again um please be considerate that i'm in the uk so some of these uh, manufacturers especially some of the other cool ones i've seen on reddit and stuff someone made a list on reddit of all the kind of um uh, cruisers out there 26 inch and 29 inch um that are like you can get and most of the great like independent brands are us based i won't be able to get them here importing that stuff over will just cost too much so i want something that i can buy in the uk preferably something i can pick up if i can't something that i'm able to get delivered and i'll be more than happy to take your suggestions so yeah leave me a comment or send me a mail and i will be grateful for that um what else is next on the list here ba 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 Oh, ATM robbery in Ireland. I love this shit because I'm obsessed with the fucking Pink Panthers. So some um, absolute goons in Ireland decided to rob an ATM machine, which, you know, you don't really hear people doing too often. I, what you hear of people doing a lot 
it's stuff I've seen on the dark net where they're able to, I'm not sure if it's something that you can do or something people just do as a promo to uh, hoodwink people into buying um, um, shitty manuals of stuff that doesn't necessarily work. But you see people always making this thing where they're able to get um, details of somebody and they're able to kind of uh, put those details on a blank card, insert it into an ATM machine, a cash point, and they're able to kind of withdraw whatever balance is available on that on that card, right? And I've, um, But the, the, obviously the only hindrance being that uh, most cash machines in the area that you get a cash machine out of have CCTVs around, so you're going to might get clocked on camera. And also, most banks or most bank accounts have like a cap on how much money you can take out from a particular card. So it's not necessarily the best thing you want to do, right? But it's always nice to see kind of the you know the crazy outlandish um, lengths some robbers are able willing to go to in order to kind of do the you know the scams or the robberies they want to do because you know by and large the more compli- complex and complicated your kind of robbery is the more people are involved the more likely you are to get caught right it's just not it's just not something that has like a um, it's not something that you can kind of um, get away with too easily except if you're a pink panther but this sort of outlet in Ireland decided to go for it um, this is a BBC article on it call for better security on vehicles after the ATM robbery um, so it says yeah Northern Ireland uh, plant hire manager has highlighted the need for better security in construction machines after a stolen digger was used to rip a cash machine from the side of the country of County Laundry again you can't say that though because how many people out there in the world actually know how to fucking ride drive one of these things they're incredibly complicated and you have to get a certificate or an actual license to actually do these things it's not something that you can do um, easy it's not like kind of you know it's not like kind of um hot wiring a fucking Nissan Micro. It's a little bit more complicated than that. This has happened um, at a garage outside Dungiven on Sunday morning. The Department of Infrastructure has confirmed the digger was taken from the site of a major roads project. Plant hire manager Brendan Brown said a one key fitted a number of machines. As long as you have a bunch of keys, you can relatively safe to say you can drive away with that machine. It's easy as that there. It's a bit like you can have a car and your car costs 20000 and it comes with a chipped key. If you're spending 80000 to 100 grand on a construction machine, and it comes with virtually nothing in terms of anti theft devices. The digger was taken, but there, how many how many diggers actually get stolen year in year out? I don't think it's that many, right? I assume the Department of Infrastructure is reminding constructors of the need to secure equipment on sites overnight. Given Maguire of the Federal Foundation said that one of those concerns constructions had to raise the fact that even though they do put GPS equipment in the machines and they have a lot of safety in there, that seems to be able to overridden by techniques of these criminal gangs. The cash machine was lifted into a Citroen a Berlingo car which had part of its roof cut off. A number of masked men were seen in the footage of robbery. The raid lasted just over four minutes. Wow. After the car was driven away with the machine sticking out of the roof, it is the latest series of cash machine thefts on both sides of the Irish border with police service to Northern Ireland saying it was the eighth of such incident in 2019. So they didn't get caught. The digger was stolen from the building. Last week, there was two separate cash machine ones, one outside the county and one on the wall of County Monaghan. Police warned that there were several gangs involved in taking cash machines to Northern Ireland. In March, the PS1 announced a correlation of a new team device. One customer of this garage told BBC the theft of the cash machine was a big loss, especially following the closure of banks in the area. Um, and again, this is a fucking crazy theft, right? Imagine this. Let's watch the video because I haven't actually seen the video. So here's a digger approaching a cash machine at the side of a petrol station. It basically rips through the cash machine, you know, the, the wall fairly easily, just tears through it. Um drags the cash machine out right pulls it out of the actual uh wall like a fucking toy drags it towards it the kind of ease it does itself right it's so easy gets the thing in the actual um digger thing uh rocks up to a nissan whatever it may be called right berlingo how's it gonna drop it in there though so there's a cash machine it scoops it up in four minutes they did this right this has to be a professional digger driver person too they cut a hole in the thing and it drops the cash machine inside the car right just like you know easily easy done easy goes they beat it up they come they 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 take the key out of the digger they jump into the van and they drive away but i wonder how much cash is actually in a cash cash machine I don't know. Like, there might be what maximum? Um, how much money? Let's see. Let's see how much money. Uh, how to Google? Oops, sorry. How much money is in a cash machine? Uh, two hundred thousand dollars. Two hundred thousand pounds. Oh, Jesus Christ! Is that it? It's a lot of hassle to do to kind of around seven hundred, around seventy thousand is in there um wow it's a lot in it it's not that much actually considering 
No, but it's not again. You're stealing everything, right? But if, you might have to steal the car. You probably stole the car to cut, and then you cut a hole in it. There's four of you in the gang. Maybe, maybe a couple more. Maybe there's a, a an actual boss, the head of the overall gang. Um, splitting splitting that money is probably like maybe what ten grand in it for each of you, which again isn't that much for you know four minutes of work. Ten grand is a pretty good, good return. But Jesus Christ, man! And there's been what they said there's been eight right overall in the um, in the entire of 2019, right? Is it eight? Uh, it was the eighth incident in 2019. Jesus Christ, already it's only April. Island guys are going in ham. But yeah, it reminds me of the audacious... Do you remember the um, the video of the Pink Panther robbery in the shopping centre? Pink Panthers... Pink Panthers uh, robbery. Let me see if I can find... It was in Dubai where they drive the cars in. Have you guys seen that? Let's watch this then. This is, this, this is the real shit. This is, where you, this is where you become a real fucking goon, right? Let's 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 get on here. Let's show this. Get us up again on the screen. This is it, one right? I think it's that one, the Kremlin one. Yeah. Look at this. This is the Pink Panthers, a gang out of um, mid, well, Eastern, Eastern Europe for the most part, right? Um, formed the people from the former Serbia, Montenegro. They rock up to a jewelry store in in fucking Dubai, smash through it with guns. They don't. They use guns, but they don't never kill or harm anyone. It's always just threatening violence, right? We go in. The, obviously, the staff ran up to the back. The, the Pink Panthers come into the jewelry store and just basically smash every single cabinet and grab whatever's inside it. Grab, 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 grab. I think it's done under. In what, how, how long it took it to do? Really short amount of time, innit? I think so as well. Serbians going in ham, bruv. Look at that, taking everything, literally cleaning out the entire spot. Crazy shit, man. Absolute crazy shit. Wow. Wow. And then they complete, and they will drive out. Easy done, easy goes. That's the, that's that's where the real theft gang comes into it. But yeah, um, I, I guess big up those. Um, I guess big up the goons in Ireland out there. Uh, you know, jacking shit and <laughs> what you call it, jacking stuff out of fucking um, out of ATMs and stuff. And um, uh, yeah, I hope the money and the trouble was worth it. But I don't know, man. Seventy grand slip it between like six people plus a boss. Maybe that's not my kind of vibe. And again, that's why probably why I'm speaking here into a camera to an audience of 15 people. Because, you know, I'm not cut out for that life. Anyways, um, HBO pulls the Michael Jackson documentary. This is interesting developments, right? So the what's that? Leaving Neverland, right? Um, documentary that has um, been sweeping the social media airwaves and for the most part has been used as a platform to accuse Michael Jackson of indecently assaulting or sexually assaulting minors that he invited over to his Neverland ranch. I, being a Michael Jackson fan, um, I was one of the people that decided to buy a ticket for his last ever tour that he was meant to be doing in the UK. Um, if, of, of, obviously, in a run up to that actual uh, tour, he sadly passed away. And I'm, you know, I'm one of the biggest Michael Jackson fans out there, like anyone else. I watched all these, all these, I watched all these performances. I recorded that stuff on VHS. Watched it again and again and again. So much so that the VHS tape itself broke. Um, uh, I did. I performed the Michael Jackson routine at a talent show when I was maybe seven years old like i'm involved with michael jackson i love him to bits but watching that documentary you can't help but feel like fuck man past that story have to be true right there's no way someone would accuse somebody of something like that um if it wasn't true him 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 being passed away too there wasn't didn't necessarily feel like there was going to be that much to gain from it overall it just felt like they needed to get the story out there I didn't necessarily get the feeling that they were doing it for monetary gain. But over time, this stuff has started to unravel a bit. Since, since we've learned details about the accusers, there's been accusations that one of the dudes who had that jewelry box showing the stuff that Michael Jackson gave him as a gift to kind of keep quiet, 
um, some of the rings, I think specifically maybe the Rolex ring, that someone said that it was made after Michael Jackson died, like loads of stuff like that. Um, the other dude, Wade, um, they, were, they were saying that he was a bit of a dicey person because he was obviously in it for money. He said, I think previously he was in it for money. Anyway, loads of things didn't make sense. And then I think the final nail in the coffin was supposed to be director of the show admitted that the timelines of whatever happened weren't necessarily in chronological order. They just mashed them together in order to kind of make a better narrative, which again, you know, in documentary world, because people like you, I guess most documentaries, you should you should assume document, most documentaries are not an accurate representation of what happened. They're just basically a, an interpreted in, an interpreted version of events from the director, right? I think that's what most people were thinking, but I think ever since the fine um killing to catch a murder was it was what's that one with the two with the brothers uh with um something brendan darcy um how to make a murder i forgot that one i think ever since that documentary most people have seen um documentaries as a way to kind of enact justice justice right as a way to kind of you know rewrite some wrongs and stuff as opposed to just like a good a good kind of you know a kind of fictional film but that guy is basically of this HBO documentary admitted that the narratives didn't fit. And now HBO pulled it, right? And this is the article talking about it, right? HBO pulls a plug on a Neverland documentary. Oprah Winfrey deletes the interview. Oprah Winfrey being the kind of, you know, the quintessential jumper on of this thing. She interviewed both of the accusers and she was kind of first on it of kind of accusing Mark Jackson with this stuff and kind of wanted to be the first to kind of talk about it. And now there she is hiding her hands. So, um, so you know how last month Mark Jackson accuses, is this what article? This is a KYCD. So I don't know what, if this is any truth to it but let's read it you know how michael jackson um accuses james safe chuck was caught in a huge lie in leaving neverland documentary hbo safe chuck claimed he was abused inside the train station at neverland ranch which he later found out was ne wasn't even built during the time he claimed the abuse took place meanwhile it looks like hbo has quietly taken the documentary off air according to reports network was supposed to air never until september but now the doc is ending this week it may also have something to do with the fact that the state of michael jackson is currently suing hbo but i think they were going to do that before right they threatened to sue uh hbo for millions before they even aired the thing to kind of put them off to doing it. HBO said fuck you and did it anyway. Um, and Mal Jackson's nephews are raising money to film a counter documentary, which is strange as well. Film and counter documentary, you know, you, if you're his nephew, you're only going to say good things about him. It's not necessarily evidence that he didn't do what you're saying he did, right? I don't think so. Uh, oh, and as far as Upper Winfrey, all the interviews with Wade Robson and James Sofchak have been deleted from my YouTube channel. Interesting. Huh. So yeah, that's that's essentially what we found out from that. Hopefully, let's see if I can get some more information because this this website is shitty. Uh, find leave leaving Neverland right, leaving leaving Neverland, HBO. Let's see if anything else has happened here. But yeah, it's interesting because I think you know uh, they deny doing it. Okay, they deny pulling it, but it's gonna be. Um, it's because I, I just don't know. I'm always a bit skeptical about it anyway because I just didn't know what the ultimate goal was. Because, you know, again, he's dead in the ground, right? He's he's not around anymore to kind of, you know, defend himself or to answer for his crimes. And number two, especially after the whole thing that happened with, um, what's his face? The British dude that molested loads of kids back in the day. I just don't think there's enough good, there's that much goodwill. Even though Mike Jackson's a legend, I just don't think there's that much goodwill that there will be no one credible that would come forward who everyone could say, agree, okay, now he's telling the truth. Because I think even the two guys that we saw in the documentary, we were still, I think viewers are still a bit on the fence. Especially when you read into their stories and what, how, they, what, you know, their role that they played in Michael Jackson's career and all that sort of stuff and, and the things that they've kind of gained from being associated with him, especially their parents with the house, all that sort of stuff. It came to just seem a bit dicey. It didn't really seem, it seem to make much sense overall um and i just i don't know i just i just thought there would have been a more people that would have come out that would have kind of lent real credible um sources to it i think even the maid that came out recently she was um shown to be somebody that was always trying to kind of take money out of the Jackson estate just dicey anyway this article here says hbo denies pulling it um it says as following a rep may shows the deny the network is pulling the 11 the leaving neverland documentary countering report by radio station 93.1 um 93.9 wks quentin safer hbo executive vice president said um hbo later confirmed the film hadn't been pulled leaving neverland remains on hbo's linear program until april 16th after which it will be continued to be available hbo now hbo go the documentary is already second most watched HBO thing in the past 10 years. DX has reached out. To, but again, what that rep, what that person said, they didn't say, they didn't say they were going to take it off completely. They said they were going to, it was going to run until September, but now it's been pulled early in April. And I'm assuming because of the, uh, the, the, the suing, the thing that's going on in the court. Um, 
It appears HBO planned to stop airing the documentary this month. According to HBO website, the only listing on Matt Jackson related series is April 17th. There are no further dates listed. The integrity of the Jackson accusers, James Strasburg and Wade Robson, was called into question earlier this month. Let's see this article. Um, after a key component of Safe Chuck's account of sexual abuse was proved to be impossible, um, Safe Chuck claimed Jackson sexually assaulted him in 1998 1992. While both under oath and in documentary interviews explained one particular incident happened at Neverland train station, but the train station didn't begin construction until 1993 but the end um, that's just one detail you can't say because you got that one detail wrong did happen Oprah Winfrey also seems to distance herself from documentary all of her public tweets regarding the, the documentary have been removed an interview she conducted disappeared from her YouTube the Jackson Estate is also suing HBO but I'm assuming he, my Oprah Winfrey's team just did that to make sure she doesn't get sued for big butts because you know, Oprah Winfrey's got that kind of bank to get sued for that amount but again um, sad way it's always it's ended in general his legacy has been tarnished the people that are accusing him have been thrown in the mud people are saying that they're liars it's just a complete it, it's, it's one of the rare occasions where a public um, shaming or the core public opinion has not favoured anyone no one's won in this occasion right no one's won Michael Jackson's not won because his legacy is tarnished the accusers haven't won because people are now accusing them of doing it only for the money and trying to get money out of the Michael Jackson estate no one's no one no one's looked good in this situation everyone comes out looking at a complete arsehole um and again i'm just feel sorry for the entire families involved in it because you know again the, the ones that suffer mostly are the families that are involved in it by and large but yeah this is what's happened when you um are attracted by the light of these celebrities for the most part and that's what happens when hero worship only gets you this kind of issue imagine leaving go, leaving australia to travel to the other side of the world because you want to be next to the star power of michael jackson i just don't know i just don't know, I just don't know. I just don't know what's happening there. Is there anything else I need to talk about before I leave? Oh, Louis Vuitton Staples Collection. Let's talk about that. That looks fucking awesome. Um, dare I say it, this might look better than the entire ready-to-wear collection that Virgil Abbott has done to date. Uh, maybe with the exception of that debut collection because of everything that it meant. But this is a really good um, thing that they're doing, right? So it's an article I saw on Hype Beast, on the old Hype Beast, Hype Beast. A uh, stay position by Louis Vuitton offers accessible minimalist wardrobe essentials, right? Let's get up here on screen. I'll read it to you first and I'll show you the images later. Um, Virg I'm going to read it only because, you know, I'm sure Louis Vuitton sent the entire press release to Hypebeast and then one of their quote-unquote writers tried to rewrite it. But let me just read what they said. Virgil Abloh's conceptual Louis Vuitton collections. Why need to start that? It's just conceptual. Okay, cool. Um, have, if anything, Louis Vuitton... <sighs> Just read the thing, actually. No, don't get critical. Virgil Abloh's conceptual Louis Vuitton collections have. If he, he's not conceptual, though, really, is he? he's a great designer, but I don't think I don't think even he would say he's conceptual. Um, have impressed critics and fans alike, though one could argue they don't cater to the average consumer. Not any, not everyone can wear harnesses and billowing cargo pants as part of their day-to-day -day wardrobe. Um, enter stay position by Louis Vuitton. The concise array of menswear pieces caters to those seeking premium essentials uh, to round out their wardrobe. The goods themselves take the form of recognizable silhouettes ranging from hoodies and denim jackets to tailored blazers, puffers, but feature subtle tweaks and lavish construction that befits Louis Vuitton's luxury repetition. Reputation, sorry. Fabrication is key to the collection with top, to top shelf fabrics sourced for each item. Considering the battery leather gloves hat backpack and a beige cashmere hoodie and coat or or re replete with subtle details that include carbon attachments uh leather straps louis vuitton branded buttons similarly the cotton from the denim jackets and jeans is sturdy yet soft thanks to a special wash with gold buckles and branded buttons reinforcing luxury outfits have they seen this in person i don't think they have complete collection of items will launch in this debut tables collection by louis vuitton range including field jackets leather jacket da, 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 da. again just listing what's there it's going to be it's going to be out on the 3rd of may right and i think it's great let's get let's get it up in full image so i'm going to make this screen bigger I think it's better than, than the ready to wear, man. This is a really good collection. So by and large, it looks like it, it, it's, you know, the article's making it seem like this is for the person that doesn't want to have, wear gaudy, ready to wear collection clothes. But I think this might be um, uh, Louis, uh, Virgil and Louis Vuitton's version of a diffusion line, right? Because I've always been fascinated with um, the kind of uh, resistance that most companies' brands nowadays have towards um, diffusion lines. They were kind of a staple for me growing up and trying to be getting into fashion. They were a way for me to kind of buy into brands. I look at kind of Mark Jacobs being the obvious one, right? Trying to buy into a brand and kind of work your way up the ladder of um, covetable items. The first thing you'd get was maybe something from the diffusion line, right? In days gone by, the first thing you might get 
from the mainland of Louis Vuitton might be a belt, right? It might be a wallet, it might be a coin purse, it might be a bag, it might be a satchel, it might be a t-shirt. You kind of buy those things and you kind of hopefully by and large over time get an appreciation for the fabrication, the cut of that item and then you essentially go up into buying the other stuff in the collection. But nowadays, there seems to be like, you know, with most companies making, I don't know, um, satchels and shit that like I have and whatever, um, side bags, hats and sneakers and uh, snap and whatever it may be called, those have kind of replaced the fusion lines, it feels like for the most part. Um, but it looks like, you know, there's with the introduction of brands like Wardrobe and NYC that have like a, a, a massive pack that you can buy. Um, and again, oh yeah, that makes sense, doesn't it? Because Christina, whatever, Christine something, the, the woman that styles Off-White and some of the Louis Vuitton stuff, she's one of the co-founders of that Wardrobe NYC brand. So this might come, this might come as an inspiration from that, right? Because Wardrobe NYC, if you don't know, is this brand where they essentially sell you a pack, men and women, they sell you a pack of clothing. I think it comes in maybe three tiers, but essentially you get like an overcoat, you might get a, a, a down jacket or a rain jacket, then you might get a, a blazer, a really a pack of nice free t-shirts, really well cut, um, some trousers and maybe a pair of trainers. They'll come like in an entire pack. So it's basically a staple collection. They're mostly in black navy or gray or white or whatever. And that essentially is about grand something. So essentially for somebody that wants to kind of wear the same sort of uniform again and again and again. And I think this kind of takes inspiration from it and i think by and large like i said i think it looks better than the mainline collection for me um it just looks really clean um and again um, i'm not too sure how it's going to be priced i'm not sure if it's going to be cheaper than what we see from the other stuff that he does previously let's get some full screens if it works um but yeah i like i really like the look of it man i think it looks incredibly good um the detail on the buttons is fucking banging no that looks really fucking awesome like the lv on the button uh sewn in that looks fucking nice um, again, the staple collection, um, little um, tag on the side of it, staples edition, how to pack your garment. Um, again, this is my, my time with Virgil, you know, being the travel junkie that he is. He travels so much for his work and the stuff that he does. So that might tie in with that as well, being, you know, because um, Gary V does that too, right? He's, he wears a particular beanie whenever he's going places and he's got that airport beanie vibe that he does. Again, I love it, man. Look look at the suit. The suit looks great, right? Nice, relaxed fit. Um Again, maybe the staple kind of collection in there in terms of the tie in there on the side of the of the jacket. It's a nice little detail there. Has it got the LV on the buttons there too? Nope. That would be good if it had it though. I think it only has it on the overcoat, on the trench coat. That denim jacket outfit looks amazing. To be honest, it looks like Virgil, which I'm happy it does. You know, a lot of brands, especially I look at someone like JWN, so I'm a big fan of, you know, he doesn't necessarily look like his brand, right? But I like designers that look like their brands, right? Like um, a Rick Owens comes to mind, right? Um, The guys at like Marcus Almeida, um, I don't know, loads of others I can mention. Um, but I like that this entire look essentially looks like something Virgil would wear, right? Day in, day out, right? When he's DJing or whatever he may be doing, right? These kind of um, mum jeans, uh, the denim jacket, just looks fucking cool. I love everything about that look, by and large. And yeah, you've got the nice chain as well that he's been famous with doing, making these great little details on top of it. The washer jacket is really nice too, actually. Looks really, really nice. Again, I'm saying, it's, for me, it looks even better than the Ready to Wear collection. It might not be for some people, but I fucking love it. I think it looks awesome. Down jacket, trainers, a snapback hat, you've got a waist bag, you've got the, that shirt that's come from the main line too, right? with the pockets all over it. It reminds me of the stuff that Head Porter done or WTS band done back in the day. But again, I'm a big fan of it. Leather gloves. I think it looks amazing. Staples collection meant to be out on the 3rd of May, but I'm sure we'll hear more of that news soon. Um, I think that might be it, mate. I think that might be it. I think that might be it. This is episode number 178 of the Exxon Zinger Show. Thanks so much for tuning in. This might be the last episode of the week. I might have to do another one tomorrow. We'll see how that goes. But until then, all information regarding me, check my website. The link is below, exxonzinger.com. Um, uh, I'm also uploading all my podcasts on SoundCloud, so you'll be able to see all of them on there. There, if you want to listen to the audio, um, I think is the best place to put all that kind of stuff. I'm not sure I didn't do it before. Spreaker might you, I might use Spreaker as my place to kind of send out and um, um, send out the RS feed to get it on the different platforms and stuff. But I'll use SoundCloud as a way to kind of distribute it, so I can easily include it in articles and stuff I want to send out or on SoundCloud or on fucking Twitter or on social media and all that malarkey. So you should check that out too. That'll be on my website too, um, actionsinger.com at the top. Click podcast and it'll turn you to the SoundCloud page. Listen to past episodes. And for those of you guys that are familiar with um, 26 inch BMXs, 29 inch BMXs, and you have any suggestions for stuff I want to buy, please let me know because I want to buy a Colt. Um, I want to buy the Colt bike or I want to buy the other one. What was the other one called? 
Uh, I'm thinking of buying either the Colt Devotion 26 BMX or the Kink Drifter 26 inch. So let me know what you think. I'm six foot uh, exactly. I weigh about, I don't know, 220 pounds. If you think of any other bike that I think I should get instead, please let me know. But if I don't see you then, take care of everyone nearest and dearest to you. And I'll see you guys again tomorrow or some other day very, very soon. Peace.